how many of this is your first year gardening here? Oh, half, over half the group. Great. You're in for a surprise. <laughs> Have you tried to dig a hole yet? <laughs> oh my God. You've never heard the word caliche until you moved here, which I think in, in Native American terms, it's rock through ground or something. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a calcium layer through the, there's a band of soil where calcium just settles and it's as hard as bone. It really are concrete. So you take a diggy bar and go thunk. And so you gotta pick through that or just things will die. I've had literally things in the ground right here. Everything I plant dies. I move over this much and it will start to live. And it's simply a way the soil perks or drains or it's fractured makes a difference. The hardest gardening I've done so far is I live up in Eagle Ridge up by the Prescott Lakes area. We've, we've gardened all over, from Skull Valley to Prescott Valley to the Verde Valley to everywhere in between. Chino Valley, we had farms for years. I know the county. This is the hardest gardening I've done at this house. It's on the north slope, so it gets shaded, especially in the winter, and it's heavy, heavy clay. I thought I had it bad in Skull Valley. We lived, our kids basically grew up on Kirkland Creek. So the soil looks really thick and good, but then it's real silty, it's, it's heavy, uh, small, small particles. So we tend to overwater and it would just kill stuff. I thought that was bad. Oh no, this is worse. So it's just north slope, doesn't dry out. So I have to be really careful and I'm playing with rain harvesting and all the stuff that is trendy. I like to play with the, the leading edge of stuff. And so you tend to kill stuff when you do that. <laughs> So I rain harvest, passive rain harvest. I've come off the gutters and go through the ground and I kind of have this load up the soil and saturate. I have killed more manzanita back there. So manzanita will not grow in my backyard. Just won't. I've tried five times. Every single one have died. So the only way I'm going to get that to live is if I go, if I abandon the soil and start going in containers. Uh, also, we're on a heavy, heavy slope. We've got the classic mountain town. Dug out basement, the first floor you walk right into, the second floor is downstairs in the basement area. You walk out the back to the backyard. And so that's, a lot of you have the same exact format. Uh, that soil, many of your soils are actually dead. When they dug that basement out and they, they scraped off the little bit of top soil that you, you had originally, They've left you with soil that literally has no living organisms in it whatsoever. It's dead soil. And you would think that's not the case. You'd think you'd just be able to plant and worms and mycorrhizal and fungi would just magically start happening. It doesn't work that way. You have to actually recreate that topsoil many times. So in our house, I was killing stuff. I tried it. And it's pretty. We've, we've been working on it for about 12 years now. And it's... Pretty, you walk back there and you go, oh, that's pretty, that's, that, that guy might own a garden center. And we do. It's ponds and waterfalls and, and fire pits and grills and it's just a magical place, my respite. It's where I unplug from, from my cell phone and go have my therapy session with the birds and the dogs and we just like playing together. The way I got past killing stuff was I just went to raise beds. I took the uh, downhill slope and I put a retaining block on the backside and then I backfilled with good potting soil on the uphill side so I have at least that much soil uh, on each of the raised beds. So these, it's just basically this beautiful tiered garden stepping down all the way from the street all the way down to the back of the garden. And it's been a process. And I thought I'd share a couple things on raised beds specifically, at least it's gonna go over more of the container stuff. Don't plant with wood. Don't use wood. Two, two reasons. One, it dates your house from the 1980s. It screams 80s. You pecky cedar, timbers, railroad ties. It screams 1980s. Kind of, I mean, style does count with, with home values. We've trended now. We, then we've switched from that to flagstone. And then we've gone from flagstone to basically pre-made concrete block, which looked like this. I'm going to tell you the place to go to buy it, too. So this is a pre-engineered concrete block. You can get it any color you want. Comes in. It can, you can match your house color if you want, or your sidewalk color. You can really have fun with these. And these do not rot, and they don't shift as easily. And you can go up to about three foot high with these before you have to start getting special fabrics and pinning them and 
but you can easily go up to knee high and not have to worry about the, the hill or the pressure behind it pushing the, the, the wall out. Okay, great way to go. Pretty easy to handle, uh, pretty easy to, to stack. It's got a lip here that kind of locks each other in place. I really, for myself, this is a block that Home Depot sells in Lowe's. I don't care for this one as much. It's a little bit smaller and you can't, it shifts. It's harder to work with. It, it's not as long lasting. The place to go to, here's the inside scoop. This is where all the contractors go. And this is where I kind of go. A uh, Yamakai block, they're the local manufacturer. But these are off the Sundog Ranch Road. And here's the real inside scoop. Ask for their seconds. So if you do a big commercial project, you're gonna, you're gonna lock in a certain color, and then there's always some overrun. So they stack these over here. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're just extra leftover. You might not be, be able to pick all your colors, but you can get them at like a fraction of the price. So just a local a way to go with that. If you do go with wood, and that's pushed a lot. I saw, saw over at Costco, they have a wood system that's tiered. Um, that can work. What I find is my pecky cedar, I've got steps of pecky cedar that now I'm starting to replace because they're rotting out. They've lasted about 15 years. And so then they're just gone. So about, and they've been rotting. I've been trying to keep them secure for, for like a while. So maybe you don't even get 10 years out of them. And they start to rot. If you are going to use wood, use good work, wood. So cedar generally is good. Redwood is the best. This have you priced out redwood lately? It's crazy. It used to be so inexpensive. Now it's crazy man price for the good stuff, the heartwood. So, but it's beautiful when you get it done. I mean, it's it's a piece of art. If you're if you're a woodsman, I mean, that's kind of wood wood worker kind of really looks good, and it'll last pretty well. Uh, you can go ahead and, and secure that a little bit by painting it inside with some tar kind of base, tar kind of stuff. Hey Cheryl, can you turn that uh, phone down? Yeah, thank you. Um, that can help get it through a little bit more for you. I generally don't like to put tar and chemicals in my vegetable gardens because that stuff can leach out into your soils or we really don't know if it leaches or not. There's, there's two rules of thought, we just don't know, but if in doubt, just keep it out, is my, is my thinking. So I generally don't use that kind of stuff. Um, I have actually used leftover pavers, like these. And if you're only going up a foot or so, works pretty good. They shift, they don't lock in place like the other block does. And I, I don't lay them this way, I'll put them this way so I get a little more uh, leverage with it so they don't slide as much. It's not ideal, but if you got them, use them. It's like a free, it's like leftover jobs. So I'll just kind of take some of these and lay them up and backfill with, with good soil. We'll go over soils in a second. And then one that's used actually pretty often. You see on Pinterest quite often, cinder blocks. They'll make them like this, and then they'll actually fill these with soil and fill it, make plants coming out the middle of that. So it's it's, uh, it can look a little hokey, or it can look designer-esque. It just depends on how you put it together. So they'll actually plant inside these holes and stuff. Uh, or you can also use this and then stucco the front. That's actually a real good look. You can match your house quite often. And then you can get a capstone that goes over top. Kind of gives it a dressed up, finessed kind of feel. Looks pretty good. So that's a real good choice. Here I would say, this is not, the book says this is deep enough. What I find is two blocks high is better than one block high, especially for things like potatoes, tomatoes, your deeper rooted things, uh, your, your larger uh, rooted like daylilies, they're gonna prefer a little deeper root structure, a little more soil. So I'd go two, two high instead of just one. For things like lettuce, <laughs> I mean, marigolds, they don't have a root structure this deep, it doesn't matter. But the book always says eight inches, that's all you need. You find it's not quite enough frequently for, for my gardens. Uh, just school of hard knocks. Let's go over container types. <laughs> I do a lot of containers. Um, I don't like plastic, plastic pots, plastic of any sort. I tend to overwater them. Now, we're gardeners, that's why we're here. 
You're, you're, you made a statement about yourself by showing up at a garden class, and you're hanging out with other cool people here, <laughs> taking a garden class at Water Garden Center. Um, we're generous people. Some of you, your hobby is not gardening. Some of you, your hobby is watering. <laughs> so you're out there with a coffee cup and a hose every morning, and I tend to overwater my plastic pots. I just tend to, especially when it's cool at night, in the spring and in the fall, I just have an issue. I tend to get root rot and damping off and things that happen with too much water. So that's, and when you pick them up about year two or three, the sun's been beating on them and the lip just kind of breaks off. They become brittle. And so they aren't, it's not ideal. You, you generally find folks start with plastic because they're a couple dollars less expensive. And then they go, they curse it and they move on. They move up to, they kind of learn and you move up. This is kind of what I've learned. I've done wood quite a bit. Wood, I, we used to do uh, wine barrels until you all started drinking so much. And now they're using all those wine barrels and reusing them. So you can't get them very, they're actually really expensive. Wine barrels got so absorbent. And the reason I'm using them for scotch and, and all these other casket kind of stored uh, liquors. And so they're not releasing them as, as often as they used to. So the price has climbed dramatically. So now we're starting to recreate kind of like making them like barrels. What I find with wood, the bottom will rot out in about five years. You'll pick it up and just the dirt kind of goes, boom, comes out the bottom as the bottom rots. The top will look fine, the sides will look fine. The bottom just rots out eventually. So I don't care for, for wood. I do like the way it grows. You can grow really nice. It, it breathes. It's a good material. Plants like to grow in wood uh, type of containers. Uh, my preferred is uh, the glazed pots. I like those because they're pretty. I'm a flower grower. Lisa's more of a veggie. Actually, we're both flower growers. We're flower growers. And we have some vegetables. But basically, you come to our house, you have pretty flowers. Uh, they're just pretty. They go with just about anything. And they breathe. And so the, the clay actually insulates the roots some, yet it holds some moisture. So I find my, I'm less prone to overwatering those than I am with plastic. They last for years and years. Uh, they just are easier to grow in. Stay away from clay, the, the uh, uh, Mexican clay and Italian clay. They tend to, to freeze and thaw, tends to crack them, or the, the, uh, they'll start to flake. They just don't last. If you're gonna, if you're gonna actually garden the clay, the terracotta <clears throat> kind of stuff, dry store them during the winter. Don't leave plants in those through winter. Where it will break, you'll get maybe two years out of maybe only one year. Mexican clay, you'll get maybe not even that long. I've literally seen, seen some of those melt in the rain. Because the, the, the Mexican clay, they, they fire them in a fire pit. So it's bad clay, and they don't have, it's not kiln dried. And so that's why you get that character, the charred, and the, it's, they're beautiful. Uh, but they just don't last because the quality of the clay and, and the fire process is not good. They're just for decorations up here. Or they're for your, your second home down the valley. In the deserts, you can go because they don't get freezing thaw, they, like we do. Um, and then the Italian clay, the, the, we've got the red clay. Actually, we do German clay. It's actually a little bit better than the Italian. So we'll get you, if you do make a mistake, it, it's the best we can get in red clay. But I'm telling you, even that, don't leave it out in the winter or you'll get maybe two, three years and it'll start to crack and flake. It's just school of hard knocks. Um, size of pots. If you're gonna go containers or size of soils or volumes, how much soil do you need? The more soil you have, the better. And your soil is your sponge holding pattern. It's your, it gives you, it holds food and water. The more of that you have, the more mistake. Now you go off to that three-week Panama Canal cruise, come back, and things are still alive. Because you know what home, home sitters do? They kill your plants. That's what they do. They feed the dog and kill your plants. So no matter how good they are, that's just kind of part of the, that's part of the price you pay when you travel. Um, I find that the bigger the pot, the more fudge factor. You have, you have the drip system go down and, and it's it didn't water for, for a week and still things are, are somewhat alive. You can recover from that. So I did bring a couple of examples 
of sizes. I would never grow in this size pot anything. Well, I do have one. I've got some sedums, cactus, that kind of stuff. I've got some sedums that I never water. They're going. At, they're on a table. Everyone wants a pretty thing on a table, uh, like that. In the full sun, where it just radiates heat. It's pretty. It needs something. Uh, for my my backyard, I use. I'm embarrassed to say this. Fake flowers. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Little tiny fake flowers in the back, where I just can't get things to grow. On the front, I do use sedums. But I, I use good grade. I mean, people actually smell my, my big flowers. And they go, oh, these are so pretty. But you know those aren't real. So just, uh, but if you surround your fake flowers with a bunch of real flowers, so the big pots around the, 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 the gardens and patios, and then that little thing sitting there on the settee set is probably fake. <laughs> or I've got a side table where it's really, it's, I, can, I can put a big pot and I can really have some flowers. But I, I wouldn't use this size pot because it just doesn't have enough soil to deal with our dry climate. It's just not enough soil capacity. Um, this is made for houseplants. This is 29 bucks. Made for houseplants. It's not made for outside in the full sun with a radiant wall behind it. And it, it would look good for about three days and then vaporize and die. I would say minimum size that I garden in. That's a good size for just about anything you'd want. Tomatoes, to blueberry bush, to roses. Um, I would say not trees. This is not quite big enough for, for let's say, Japanese maple, or I even grow cherry trees uh, in, in a container. And it's beautiful. Um, I use it as an accent. It's there by the, by the hot tub. The only negative with a cherry by the hot tub when it's blooming, and you're in the hot tub, blossoms get in the water. I didn't think that one through quite well enough, but anyway, I do get the cherries. This is a, this is one I use. This would be minimum size. I grow a lot of stuff like this. Pick your color, doesn't matter. The volume, I'm trying to get you the volume. This is probably 14 to 16 inch. I say 14 to 20 is ideal. You can pick the style. And then you get into proportions, like what looks good in front of the pillars in front of your front, in front of your house. This might not be big enough for a bigger house, that grand entrance. You may want to upsize it or go with something a little taller or put it on a platform of some sort. But for growing plants, this is a good, good volume size. I grow trees, and I'm not gonna lift this one up. Let's see, how much is this, baby? Get you a feel for cost. 100 bucks. Or in retail terms, you call that 99, 99. <laughs> with tax, 105 bucks. Anyway, I grow trees in this kind of size. I think I saw this was 149. So you can see the get a, get a size, get a volume. I had uh, some spiral junipers that had grown in front of our garage on either side, a classic look, container on each side. Had some real pretty upright junipers. And I had them growing in this in a pot just like that. Been, I've had that pot for 10 years, gone through many winters. And it finally succumbed to my son. Oh. Again, we're on a slope. He's learning to drive a stick shift. Oh, no. <laughs> and he didn't quite catch the gear. The truck rolled back, and that, that pot cracked right from this way to the. It just went right. There was no recovery at that point. And so I transferred everything. I wanted a new color anyway. Sometimes you get bored with, I'm just tired of that color. Ten years of cobalt blue is enough. Let's go to jade green, or aqua, or red. So anyway, that's... So for size-wise, you can look at the volume of this. You can grow almost anything you want in, in that size pot. And again, I've got a Lapin cherry that produces like crazy in a pot that size. It's been in there for many, many years. Uh, what I do is I keep it topped so I don't let it get out of proportion. I keep it looking so it looks balanced to the pot size. I kind of keep it trimmed. And the secret with that, the trees, prune it midsummer. So it does, because that's when it puts all the suckers out. So I just trim it in the winter and I also trim it in summer. Keeps it down to size. Works really, really good. What to fill? Oh, I brought this one too. Let's see. I'm going to put that. I can just see disaster happening. You can go artsy fartsy too, like urns. There's almost unlimited style. That's just something we saw 
and went, ooh, those are neat. I've never seen that color, never seen that shape, that size. That'd be neat. And that would look good on the front patio, the, the front entrance with the columns. That would look good. Um, it's soil volume. The reason I brought this one is it doesn't matter whether it's wide or deep. Soil volume is what you want, where roots can creep and crawl and get a hole and give you longevity. So that one's kind of awkward that it's narrow, but it's got a lot of soil to it. Probably almost as much as this one. Not quite, but it's got a lot of soil volume. You could grow almost anything you wanted in that. So Lisa and I just wrote a column for, for an article for Press School Women Magazine. It'll come out April. It's how to grow berries. What was it? Six berries you can grow in containers, I think is the exact title. Uh, it's high gloss, high pictures, looks good. For berries, berries have the grapes, they have very deep root structures. So you need some soil volume to make that happen. I would say minimum size would be this. And if you can go up a little bit larger than this for grapes and let's say blackberries, it'll, it'll be better for them. So uh, I've got a raspberry. In fact, I brought this. This is a new dwarf raspberry called Brazzleberry. I don't know where they came up with that name. Oh no, Brazzle Blueberry, excuse me. I also also have a raspberry. I grow berries in containers. They do really, really well. Blueberries actually grow better in containers than in the ground, because these guys are really, they love acidy soil. If they get alkaline at all, they'll turn yellow, they'll start producing, they'll shed their fruit. But in a good potting soil, which is mainly peat moss, it makes it very, very acidic. And a container tends to flush a lot of that mineral out. Uh, that uh, white line that forms in your, in your bathtub or your toilets or the sink, that also builds up in the soil. And so if it builds up too much, let's say for a blueberry, they'll just shed their leaves. They'll look terrible. But a pot tends to make it more acidic and it flushes that stuff out of the soil. And so it doesn't get, it's, not, it's easier to control the health of a blueberry. Blackberries and raspberries, they don't care. They'll grow anywhere. In the ground, in the container. Potting soil, here's the dirty secret. You can print a bag, and we make our own soils. Anyone, you can print a bag and write with Sharpie, potting soil, and sell it as potting soil. You can shove anything you want in there, because the bag says potting soil. The shortcut in our industry quite often, I've got a, I've got a flyer coming up. I've got to make a deadline. I only want a, a $7.99 price point. So cut the ingredients until we meet the price point. And we'll sell it, we'll call it potting soil. Be careful what you're getting, what you fill your container with. Because many times a short, there's a shortcut. Um, perlite, those little white pellets that are inside of, of, of a good soil, it's the most expensive ingredient. And so they'll start, they'll start cutting that out to save, to make the price point, to move the price point. So this is a third little secret. So if you're looking at the wall, if you're at depot or loads, you look at the wall of, of potting soils, they go from $4.99 to $12.99. Probably you want to trend towards the nice word. There's a reason that it, it's nicer. Probably has more peat moss, more perlite. It's got a, a balanced fertilizer to it. It's that kind of stuff. And the science is in the soil. Uh, our grower and I, we, we've spent three years making, tweaking the ingredients to make sure it's a fine line. You want a soil that will drain, yet hold water. That's a tricky, tricky uh, balancing act, especially in a dry climate. Um, now this is going to go live on, on, on our YouTube channel, but I'll say it anyway. Stay away from that miracle Grow crap. That stuff is awful. It kills more plants. I've got more customers struggling with that stuff, um, especially the water holding stuff. Don't, just don't torture yourself with that. You'll kill plants with it. So I, I know it's at Costco or at the front entrance of Safeway or wherever, but I just, I stopped selling it. We used to sell truckloads of this stuff. And I just said, that's not right. It doesn't, my customers are struggling with this. We're not gonna sell it anymore. So we just don't offer it. And it cost me some sales, but I'm not here to torture my customers. I'm here to help them succeed, not to watch stuff slowly fade. Just school of our knocks. Uh, find a good, good potting soil. I would say, 
by a water spotting zoo, but I can't say that. Actually, I can. <laughs> I got a free class, so I would say our, our number one seller is potting soil. That's our number one soil. And out on the pallets, you're seeing four basic things. Anytime you look at soil, there's only four things out there. Bottom line, there's manures, there's topsoil, which is basically, you really shouldn't be using topsoil except for filling holes at the top of the soil. That's it. It's really compost with a lot of sand added to it. That's why it's so heavy, so it won't blow away. That's the only reason, that's what topsoil is. You've got mulch or compost or something of that. It's, it's a composted material, but it's not manure. It's a composted, probably bark product, that kind of stuff, or you have potting soil. Every time, that's all you really have. You can get bark products, but bark is mainly to top dress stuff. But really, the soil piece is manure, topsoil, mulch, or, or potting soil. What do you use for each? Manures, really you're only using it this time of year uh, to, to blend, to, to, to amend your vegetable gardens or your flower beds. And then really it doesn't get a lot of play. Maybe sometimes people use it to fall to kind of top dress or, or use it as a cover, but really it's used mainly, we sell most of it in the spring. Topsoil, I try to encourage folks not to buy that. And we make our own, we were using our mulch, we add about, I don't know, 20, 30% sand to it. First of all, I don't like loading the back of your car because it hurts my back. It's just so heavy. But it stays too wet. So if you're trying to plant in it, it just stays it's too heavy, so it stays too wet. You'll tend to way over and overdo it on the water piece. The compost, we're using an old sawmill over in Taylor, Arizona. We're taking the old sawmill tailings, we're spraying it down, and that's what's in that product. It's a true compost. It's a local compost. But again, mulches, they're made to mend our native earth. So they're made for planting directly into, or to add instead of manure, let's say I want to plant this weekend, I don't want manure to blend that into our soil because it'd be too hot. You want it to settle for a little bit. There we use compost. Mainly it's, we sell it for trees and shrubs for planting out in the yard. And then potting soil is made for filling containers. It's made to plant directly into. It's not made to cut, it's not made to to add to, or, or it's already designed to fill, fill a space, put the plant right in it. It's our grower's mix is what it is. We just put it in smaller sizes so you can get it back of a trunk. Uh, so that's, that's the bottom line. Um, there are some things online that say fill the pot up with peanuts, fill the pots with Coke cans, fill the pots with stuff to make them lighter. I don't encourage doing that. Uh, the more soil you have in a dry climate, the better off you are. So it's all about soil volume, especially when it's really arid. And we're starting, I, can you sense it in your skin? We went from that last snowstorm a couple weeks ago, and it was humid, it just felt good. All of a sudden, your lips are starting to feel crusty. We're going into that spring season where it's just arid. Uh, you get down to 10% humidity. With the prevailing southwest wind, it, it can... It can Vaporize new growth, tender new leaves, it can, it can affect your flowers. The more soil you get, the better. And a little trick I use, I love self-watering pots. But I don't like paying the price for self-watering pots. I've got them down there, they're just expensive, they're engineered, they get, get a premium for these things. I'll show you how to make your own self-watering pot. Saucer. When you water, this is unique to here. You don't want to spread this advice to your folks in Chicago or East or, or California, whatever. But here in a dry climate, this is a great little trick. Get a saucer about this deep. What is that? About two inches deep, something like that. A little deeper is a little too much, too shallow, doesn't hold enough. But I will, about this, uh, this depth is good. I'll water the plant until water comes out the bottom, just the right amount and fills this saucer up. If you're using soil, potting soil, from the top or all the way to the bottom, what the plants will do is the, the water will wick back up into where the root zone is as the plant needs it. As this is really plays out June and July when it's really quite hot. We're up in the 90s and it's still quite dry. It's before the monsoons hit. So that little trick really works well and gets me out of, I can grow some really big stuff and I can really cut back 
on the frequency of the water that I go in, if I simply do this. But if you're putting peanuts or Coke cans or some of these other hokey things they tell you to do to cut weight, the, the water won't wick up through different types of material. It has to be the same. Water wants to go through the same kind of material all the way through. So you want soil right from the roots where the plants are down to, the, to where the water is. Okay, just a little trick that works. The negative, you've got to pull these saucers off in midwinter where you tend to overwater. School of Hard Knocks, I'm telling you just, so in the spring I put these, I'm about to put these under, this weather stays, I'll put these back underneath my containers. And then uh, in the winter, you know, usually by Thanksgiving, I'll pull them out from underneath and just dry store them. So, okay. I can control my environment in a container much easier than I can in the ground. I can get my additives in there that I want to get in there. Um, I can cover it if I need to cover it. So if we're vegetable gardening right now and we start our, uh, you know, lettuces and that type of thing and it looks like it's going to get really cold, well, it's really easy to take some frost cloth and cover a container. Frost cloth is great because it's very light texture, it's not going to weigh those plants down, and this stuff lasts forever. We literally, oh, I can't talk. We have rolls that we've used here at the garden center that are probably, I don't know, 8 or 10. Pretty stinky. They're stinky, but they work. So this is a good product to have on hand. You can use towels. Do not use plastic. Do not cover your plants with plastic. They're not going to be happy with that. You want something that's going to breathe. So if I'm going to have coal, really easy to cover it. So potting soil, I can cover the potting soil so I won't go into that again. But this is our potting soil. You can see I can squeeze it and it just has a real nice texture to it. It's got the perlite in it. Uh, it's just, you should come stick your hands in it if you're not opposed to dirt. Um, but it works very, very well. It's not going to compact hard. It's just a really nice loose soil. When you're doing your container gardening, um, always start your soil moist. Sometimes when you pull it out of the bag, depending on the time of year, it can be kind of dry. You don't want to put good plants into dry soil. So when you're getting ready to do your gardening, make sure your soil is somewhat moist. This probably needs to be a little more moist. That will probably add some more water to it. The other trick is do not put a dry plant. So when you get ready to transplant, make sure your plants have been watered. You don't want to put a dry plant into, into dry soil. You're, it may look good for a little bit, but it's just it's not going to like that stress of the transplant shock on it. Um, when, I when I get my containers, the other things that I add to it, this is Aqua Boost. This is a, it helps hold the moisture into your soil. It also has mycorrhiza in it, which is incredibly important for the health of your plants. It's going to keep them really, really happy. The trick with this stuff, it gives you directions. Follow the directions. If you put too much in, you're going to have like this creature oozing out of your bucket. I know because I've done it. It's not very pretty. So you don't need a lot. A little goes a long way. Excellent for raised beds, excellent for containers. It's going to make it so you're not having to continually put water on those guys all the time. It gives you a little bit of leeway on the water. The other thing that I usually mix into my containers, so this is our all-purpose plant food. This is a natural food. There's nothing synthetic. There's nothing synthetic in this. It's an all-natural food. It also has a little bit of soil sulfur, a little bit of iron in it. So it's got those minerals uh, that are terrific for our plants. It's a 744. Um, you can use it on flowers. You can use it on vegetables. It uh, doesn't matter. It's a great product to use on anything in the yard. So usually when I'm getting my soil ready, I just throw this, this stuff in and I'm mixing it in. Uh, you can put this on the end, you know, if you get it all done, you know, oops, I forgot to put this in. You can put it on top, it's not going to burn, um, but I like to just kind of mix it in. I don't think it really matters too much. It is a slow-release food, so it's going to feed for, uh, depending on what you're growing, if it's fast-growing, it's going to use the food up a little faster, uh, but typically about three months or so. Uh, so it's kind of the meat and potatoes in your diet. You know, you can't live on chocolate shakes and Coke very well. 
Uh, so this is that meat and potatoes that you need for your garden. So I have, now I chose this wood container basically just for demonstration purposes. I probably wouldn't grow uh, my veggies in it, but it was easy and light and I'm tired, it's Saturday. <laughs> I don't want it something I could lift easily. So I grabbed this kind of for demonstration purposes. I also liked the size of it. It's a good size, especially for growing uh, your veggies and some annuals because you don't need a great big huge pot if you're growing veggies or annuals because the, they're not going to be in that pot long enough that they're going to fill it with a lot of roots. Uh, so this is just a really good size to work with. And I'm not really going to lose my mind here because I'm going to use both my hands, but I'll try and talk louder. Okay. So my soil, I would add my octopus, my all-purpose. This I thought was a little dry. This is going to get messy because it's going to drip. If you are opposed to dirt, get a good pair of gloves. I usually don't wear my gloves because I forget. I like to feel the texture of the soil. Um, but even now, see, it's still not holding together very well, so I'll probably add a little more water in there. You guys can check this out later. But now it's starting to see how it's got a little more body to it. It's holding together a little bit more. So it's probably about the right moisture. You don't want it to be sopping wet. You just want it nice and moist. Now I chose for this pot, I'm going to mix some veggies and some color into it. And there's no reason you cannot mix your pretty flowers in with some vegetables. Uh, I think it's a great way to have really nice looking containers um, that you could have it in your front yard. We have containers in our front yard. We've grown cucumbers in them, uh, squash. Lots of peppers. We're salsa peppers. Peppers, though, so. And we and grow them, but we also grow them with our flowers because I want them to look pretty because they're kind of out front. So when you pull these guys out of the containers, you can kind of see how they're a little bit root bound on the bottom. Usually what I do is kind of pull that off the bottom. It's not going to hurt the plant. A lot of people go, oh my God, it's okay. Then you want to loosen it up a little bit. Because if you don't loosen or massage the roots, well, those roots are just going to kind of continue to do this. So you want to loosen them up so those roots have some place to go to. They want to go out. And this is also, when we do container gardening, the thing to think about is the thrill, fill, and spill. You've probably heard us talk about that a lot. So you want to have some interest in your garden. Otherwise, because if it's all one level, you're just kind of, yeah, it's pretty, but it's not very interesting. The eye likes to look at different textures. It likes to look at different heights. So if it's something you want to be attractive as well as functional, you want that thrill, fill, and spill. So thrill is the, the height that you want. If your container is going to be seen from all directions, if it's out and you're looking at it all the way around, Put your thrill in the middle of the pot. If your container is only seen from one side, or maybe three quarters of a side, if you're going against a corner or a wall, put it in the back. And that gives you a little more room in the front to put your uh, fill and spill, guys. I'm going to do this one in the middle. No, well, maybe I'll do it in the back. I'll do it in the back. I feel like <laughs> So just think about where your, your container is going to be put and how you want to look at it. So I'm going to use this for my grill. I could have also used, so this is upright rosemary. If you want to stay more in the herb and veggie garden, uh, upright rosemary is a great one to use. You can uh, use it for your cooking. It has beautiful purple flowers on it in the spring and in the fall. It could, so this is a perennial. So over time, this could get too big for your container. Maybe you want to move it uh, into your garden or in your landscape, perennial bed, something like that. Over time, this could get a little big. This guy is not. I chose for my filler, this is Swiss chard. Now, Swiss chard is good in green smoothies. I've never really cooked it, because uh, I don't like greens. <laughs> She's a meat potato guy. I'm a meat potato guy. But it's terrific in your smoothies. The other really neat thing about Swiss chard, look at those stems. 
beautiful red color, and it contrasts so nicely with the green. This is Swiss chard bright lights, so the bright lights will have green stems, and it'll also have a, kind of a chartreuse yellowy green stem to it as well. Uh, they make one called Ruby Red, which is a really dark, <coughs> dark red stem, uh, but also the veins and the plants are, dark, are kind of a dark red. I liked it because it matched really well with my flower. <laughs> So I thought that was really cool. Now I don't have my soil level up about where it should be. It's a little low, so these guys are going to look a little lower than they should be. When you start with your container, don't. I usually fill mine up about three quarters of the way with soil, not all the way, because you want to have some room to maneuver and work things around in. Um, so you know, mine's a little bit lower than it should have been, but about three quarters of the way. Stick your plants in, and then you can back fill in from there. So these are mine. My fillers. You're going to fill the middle of the pot. And I'm very messy when I garden. <laughs> there again, kind of loosen up those roots. I'm going to stick that one there. The other thing I really liked, so this is kale. This is an edible kale. Um, there are the ornamental kales, which you can't eat, but they're kind of a little bitter. This is a really nice edible kale. This is the uh, Russian, red Russian kale. There's Toscano, there's uh, Dwarf Blue. There's probably, I don't know, four or five different varieties of kale. Um, I haven't made kale chips. Anybody made kale chips? I hear they're wonderful. I haven't tried it. My daughter wants to try it. The thing I like about kale, too, is it is a very prolific grower. It is going, you can start harvesting off of that really, really quick. The same with your shard. You can start harvesting off of these guys almost as soon as you plant them. The more you harvest, the more the plant's going to grow. So don't be afraid to go pick leaves off of there and start using them because they're going to grow faster and fuller if you do. So this would be another one that would be a good filler. And like I said, I'm going to find a soil, so I'm just going to pretend he's going to stay up there. I'm going to stick a couple in. The other mistake I think a lot of people make, or misconception, is, oh, I can't get things too close together. I cram those suckers in there. There's <laughs> plenty. You know, if you get a, a pot that's going to give you the soil, you can cram them in, and it's okay. Uh, they will adjust to that. So those are kind of my fillers. The other thing I like, this is lettuce, leaf lettuce. Great thing about leaf lettuce, there again, you can start harvesting right away. You don't have to wait forever. You can start pulling off of it and make your salads. And you got to squeeze those soaps. So I'm kind of low on my soil, but you get the idea. It should be sitting right about here. <laughs> so that kind of gives me a nice fill. I would probably put a little towards the front too. The other thing you could do on your containers, if you want it to have more of a decorative or designer look, you want that kind of coming from the side, you can plant your things at an angle. They don't have to go straight down in the soil, you can plant them at an angle. So I can put these on the edge of my pot, because lettuce kind of drapes over when it starts filling out. So that could soften the edge of my pot. So don't be afraid to put things at an angle. There's no problem with that. That's my cream pot, and I would add, oh, I want to show you guys this. This is speckled lettuce. I might throw some of this in here too because it would match really nicely with the red and the kale and I got my flower. Uh, what a pretty pot, and you can eat from it. It's amazing. <laughs> then, once I got it all done, I would sneak some uh, violas or some pansies in there. You can actually put these in your salads makes it really pretty. Throw it in your pot. There's no reason why your vegetable pot can't be decorative as well. So I would probably, and there again, pick whatever colors you like. I love these. <laughs> these are frilly, they call it a frilly pan, or fizzle pansy. It has a little ruffled edge to it. Isn't that pretty? What do you call them? Oh, flurry skirts or something? Flurry skirts. Yeah. <laughs> you call them flurry skirts. 
But I would also stick some of those in there. You can do a six pack, you can go four in. So a six pack is nice. take your pot because it's movable and move it to a shady spot. You're going to get a lot more growth off of those in the shade. So once you start getting warm, you move it, you can still harvest. Or if you go, you know what, I'm just tired of this, I want something else, I want my tomatoes, I want my peppers, pull these suckers out. If they're, you know, if the snapdragon still looks good, move it to another part of your yard, put it in a different pot. Maybe you want a tomato in here, and your tomato is going to be your thrill, or a pepper plant. We use peppers a lot in the garden, in the containers, and then I usually throw uh, something that will be like a trailing, 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 something trailing over the edge. That'll soften that edge and make it pretty, but we can go out there and harvest and have our salsa in the evening. You could have got it. <laughs> Uh, fertilizing. Make sure you continue to fertilize. Things that are growing want a little more fertilizer. Uh, your all-purpose is that meat and potatoes, but you also want something, and I forgot to bring the flower. Oh, right. This is flower power. Flower power is a high phosphorus food, so this is your Coke. This is your chocolate shake. So it gives them a little oomph. So this you want to use about every two weeks through the season. Uh, just gives it that little extra oomph that, that keeps things really happy and healthy and growing fast. You can also use, I think Ken mentioned Fox Farm and Happy Frog. There again, we have it. It's a good product and nothing against it. It's a good liquid food, uh, but you can also use this if you want to. Watering, you're going to have to water your container pots, whether you put them on a drip. We put most of ours on a drip because we are so busy. I forget to water and come home and they're dead. So Ken, being the good guy that he is, uh, You're welcome, my dear. <laughs> ran drip line to all our pots. And it saves me a load of work to have that drip line in there. Um, it's a little, it has a little stake on it, has a little sprinkler head that comes out, and we run that. Um, <clears throat> You want to make sure you're watering adequately enough to water the entire soil in the pot. I think a mistake a lot of people make is they go out and they throw a half a cup of water on there and they go, oh, that's good. You have to thoroughly water your pot. Um, not every day, maybe, especially this time of year. Uh, in the heat of summer, if it's June, you may have to water every day. So it's going to change seasonally. Watering is very, very important, but don't Overwater. <laughs> like Ken said, be careful of some of those potting soils that say they're moisture retaining. Um, I have seen those kill more plants than I can count because it just it never releases the water and it just stays there. And roots do not want to be wet all the time. They really don't. They need a period of dryness so they can pull in the oxygen. Otherwise, you're just going to have rot. Especially when you get to your lettuces and pansies. Uh, really don't want to be wet, overly wet. So you've got to be careful with that. Am I missing anything? So I, I think the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to mix your flowers. Don't be afraid to mix your vegetables. There really aren't rules. Um, it's the rules that you put on yourself. So. Our prettiest container is a big square oxblood red pot. stands about this tall. We put a pepper, because I love peppers, hot and hotter the better. I like roasting them, I like, I can live on peppers. We put one in each corner, and we put a, a pink or a, whatever colors fancy you that year, uh, trailing or wave petunia. So the flowers come through the bottom of that and overflow the pot. And the peppers, peppers are pretty, they're real glossy green, they put a fruit on. And people come over and go, oh, look at that, it's so pretty. And it's edible. Uh, tomatoes. The front door of the pretty cage. I used to spray paint the tomato cages to a fancy color. Now they come pre-coated. I mean, they're like 
good. They, they're, that's awesome. They're finally getting some style. I really don't like galvanized metal. I mean, it just looks sterile. Uh, but pretty colors. You can add that, and then all of a sudden it turns it into art. And people go, oh, that's kind of, look what he did. They put a tomato at the front door. It's pretty. Or at the you front of your... Putting trellises. There's yeah. a lot of attractive trellises you can put in a pot and grow your beans or your peas yeah. on. Or your tomatoes. Some tomatoes like to vine, so you tie it up to that. Putting it's a fun. tomato at the front end of front end, um, edge of a raised bed comes out and flows over. Oh, instead of a vine, you can have tomatoes flowing over. That's a good look. You can, it can't get too much, especially if disease gets into them. It looks kind of ratty, but uh, it can be a a good look. So mix it up. I think. We're way past what our grandparents had. Must be the tag says plant every 18 inches, put them in rows like they're marching across the garden. We're way past that, especially if you're doing raised beds. Um, high square foot gardening is what it's really called. And the biggest mistake I find people make with containers, they space it out too much, doesn't look full. They're reading the tag or they're seeding like it's supposed to grow in a garden in a container. You can have higher density or raised beds, you can have higher density uh, production. Also, you can rotate your crops. Our raised beds, we grow our vegetable gardens in raised beds. The peas are going in right now. Peas are a cool season crop. Your nasturtiums, a cool season crop. Your sweet peas, cool season. Uh, when they get done, we've harvested those around May, they don't like the heat. So we rip those out, and that's when we put the beans in. Or we put something else that likes the heat. We'll harvest that through the end of the fall. So you can rotate your crops, as we have such a long growing season, if you're putting the right plants in. So right now, this weather will not last. It's going to snow again. Mark my words. <laughs> it'll, it'll melt like this really fast, but it, it, it'll, it'll be on the last cold cycle. So you want to make sure you put plants in the ground that like that. There's certain, like pansies love that. Snapdragons, all the stuff Lisa's has mentioned, loves. They actually will taste better if there's a light snow uh, that keeps cool. Uh, the kales will tend to bolt. The lettuce will tend to bolt. The spinach will bolt. As we get warm, the, the flavor goes. They need coolness for that. So put those things in. You'll start to see tomatoes show up at the box stores here pretty quick. Don't be tempted to plant those too early. I saw a lot of new hands going up. Uh, you, you're going to be so tempted to plant the end of March, first part of April. I'm telling you, you will have that guard reserve to go plant. Resist, unless you're willing to, to cover. Now, we've got radio shows, garden columns, magazine stuff. Gardeners, there is this bragging, right? You know, I just picked my first tomato. It was so good. How are you doing on your tomatoes? Is that bragging right? You know, but the gardeners do. I just harvested a, my first squash, my watermelon set. Uh, just I, We plant some things early, and we fully expect to cover them and protect them. I don't commit to the entire garden. I just commit a portion of it, just so I can have the bragging rights. That's the only reason. Most of the garden <laughs> will go in about Mother's Day. That's when the last frost date is. That's the first week in May. Uh, now, some years it could be the end of April, some years it could be the mid of mid May, like last year. So it just depends. The mountains of Arizona can be a little dicey. But it never stays like this. It gets warm and then it will get cold, that kind of stuff. Well, we can always hope. Yeah. <laughs> and then Lisa said, spill, you know, thrill it, get something really pretty, fill it, keep keep it full, and then have something spill over the edge. If you just aren't into that, I say kill it. Killer, killer, killer. Just get pretty stuff and put it together, cram it in. Just make sure it's not all flat, the same depth, same same level. You do want some interest. And then just have fun with it. They call that cottage gardening. Just mix it all together and have fun with it. I think you can do that. And Lisa gave us permission to put veggies in, in the stuff. So, should we take some questions? Do you want to? We'll take a few, and then those that want to hit the road can hit the road. Question right here. Correct. I would say so. Her question is eight inches is not was recommended not quite deep enough for certain crops. It depends on what you're growing. Potatoes for sure. It's it's, it's just not even close. Uh, we'll have potatoes in I think next week or the week after, so they're coming shortly. Uh, those things would, would appreciate at least ten to to sixteen inch. 
doesn't say that much. Two blocks high, that, that kind of stuff. So there's, if you Google that, you'll hear all kinds of stuff. I'm just telling you, this gardener, these gardeners have had better luck with two blocks high or 10 to, 10 to 16 inch rather than eight inch. Okay, yeah, over here. Uh, raised beds against hail. How do you do it? Hail in the in the mid July, we get what we call the monsoon. It's a wet pattern that comes up out of Mexico. Huge thunder cells start building, and they come from the east and they dump on us. And hail can be, I mean, greenhouses can be brought down by hail. So we live by fear uh, in that time of year that they'll shred the inventory. So uh, in there's different techniques you can use for that. Um, the easiest would be using PVC pipe. Irrigation pipe, schedule 40. It's thick enough to kind of be rigid but flexible enough. And you can get different parts for it and make a structure with shape cloth on top. So the hail bounces off of it. I've done that for my tomatoes especially. Squash, things, big leaf things, rhubarb. What really benefits from that. I mean, I've had rhubarb, beautiful rhubarb. And then by the time the hailstorm gets done, it's just like absolutely shredded. Also, for my more sensitive things, we've got a huge juniper tree. You can use the, tuck it just underneath the, the trees. And the trees will take the hit from the hail and protect it enough. Uh, I think the hail got our, our hydrangea last year, so big old in bloom, beautiful, and this shredded it. So it just happens, yeah. Um, two questions. That combination we have there, will it not need to be covered? So this is all, you can take the cool and be fine. If we get a really cold, like way down, below 32, 20, yeah. yeah, then I would probably cover it. Also covering it using like a frost cloth would keep it looking a little nicer. So it's not going to kill anything, <coughs> but it would keep it looking more attractive uh, to cover it. We do actually put our peppers and stuff in quite early, <laughs> by first and middle of April in containers because we know we can cover it real easily and I'll take a steak because some of that stuff can, can make it settle and crush the leaves I'll just take a steak shove it in the middle as a, as a way to keep it floating above our tomato cage and I'll just throw it right on top it works really well is there anything that have a leader? <laughs> <laughs> cactus no no I can't Now, if you have a real problem, I would probably try herbs because that is the one thing they tend to stay away from is anything in that herb family, that strong smell, they don't like it. So I have a rosemary out front that they have never touched and they usually, they've come through lately and destroyed everything else. They've left that alone. So, uh, also, she's talking about javelina, wild pigs, deer the same way, pack rats, there's all kinds of stuff. We are surrounded by forests, we get it all. Um, the herbal stuff works, the snapdragon. Every yard should have a snapdragon. They don't eat them. They look delicious, but they don't eat them. I don't know why they don't eat them. Uh, Alyssa, they seem to leave that alone. There's quite a few things. Look to your neighbors and look, go down the street and see what they're growing because they're the same herds hitting every single day. They're not just at your yard. They're grazing through at night. And so look at your neighbor and they'll tell you some stuff. Also, if they're getting really into it and you want decorative stuff, you can go to more shrubby things like Oregon grape, they don't eat that. It's a pretty yellow flower in spring. It's all, there's some things like that. Oxwood, kind of a formal look. They don't eat that. They don't bother it. They should. Yeah, so there's there's some things. The animals right now are really desperate because it's, it's starting to dry out. All the, the stuff they, they really like is either faded or it's not quite growing yet. You're in this, things are compressed right now. And so they're, they're eating things they generally won't be eating another week when their native stuff starts coming up. They, they got their favorite foods, but they're not going to starve to death. So they're, they're testing stuff. A couple more questions? Sure. Maybe in the back. Anyone in the back? No? Yes, yeah. Go ahead. We're getting ready to build a box. Yeah. And I'm thinking about two to three feet deep and maybe six feet long for our yeah. vegetables. It's all rocks and wall back there, but I think that would be best for everything I'd like to do. So I was wondering, is that sufficient? The three by six or eight? I can yeah. get a lot of stuff in there. So everyone heard that? Three by six, is that a good size? Four by eight is the standard. That's, so three by six is great. I think that'd be perfectly fine. 
And depth-wise, most of our raised beds, I've had two back surgeries. Everyone thinks we sell flowers. We sell dirt, and it's heavy. And so it kind of wears on you. I've got all my beds where I can sit, it's at your height, so I can sit and do stuff on the raised bed. Really takes some pressure. I can set things right there and plant it and take it out or harvest it. Or put, it really, especially with vegetable beds, it helps you with the harvest because you've always got a basket or something, a bucket, a bowl. So do you, put you can rest it right the there at the edge. So it works really well. Watch too when you're planting that, let's say a raised bed, make sure you put the tall stuff, tomatoes, corn, make it, make it overshadow. Don't put the tall stuff where it shadows, puts a shadow on everything else. Most of these things we're talking about require, need six hours of sun minimum. So full day is even better. The more sun, the more produce, the more flowers you're gonna get. So put them out where they're going to get some sun. So that, that's that's one thing to watch too. So position where it gets the sun, more sun. And the depth though you said? Um... Deeper's better. Okay. So don't, you said three feet, that's, that's huge. That's right up there where, I don't even have to sit down, I can just, put, I can just work on it right there. That's great. You might fill it a little bit if you want some, you can chuck the cheesy stuff at the bottom to the top layer, put the good soil is what you want. So the, put some fresh, good soil every year at the top layer of your raised beds or your containers. It'll make a difference in how well you work your plants. I just had someone having trouble with sweet peas and they, were, they had a raised bed, a box that they built, but the soil they were using, I was convinced, was not draining well enough. That particular plant is really sensitive to wet, soggy soil. So I'm sure we got her some new, a bag, new bag of water spotting, so I'm sure she can come back and go, you're a genius, oh, you're so smart. And really, it was just the soil. Yeah, I hear it all the time. All the time. I gotta hear it from someone. <laughs> but I'm sure it's gonna make a difference in, in the soil. Then and watch your soil, make sure, okay, down and back. <laughs> the soil's gonna be, our soil's organic, so we don't add the wetting agent because it's not an organic, there's no organic wetting agent uh, that wets it down well enough. So to get it moist at first can be a little bit of a challenge, so water a lot. When you first get, yeah, really water it in because it'll get some dry spots. Once it's moist, it just holds, and does, it just does great. But getting it moist initially with an organic soil can be a bit of a challenge. Just kind of put that on your, You'll figure that out real quick after you do one or two, but at first, we just want you to make a mistake. We will hang, if we didn't get your questions, we'll just be here. I'm gonna raise the curtains up so you can get in and out a little easier, but before you leave, make sure you give Lisa a round of applause. <laughs>